Take us away, B.I. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for joining Building a Beautiful Life, session number three. We're excited to continue in this exploration of what it means to, to build a beautiful life. Um, so we're really pleased to have uh, Vince Horn join us today. Um, I'm going to embarrass Vince a little bit and just read read part of his bio because I feel like it's, it's an important introduction and then we'll add a few things myself. But Vince is a part of a new generation of teachers, facilitators, and translators bringing the Dharma to life. He's a computer engineering dropout turned full-time com contemplative um, who spent his 20s co-founding the groundbreaking Buddhist Geeks podcast while si simultaneously doing a full year and in, in a, a full year in total, excuse me, of silent retreat practice. Vince began teaching in 2010 and has since been authorized in both the pragmatic Dharma lineage of Kenneth Folk and by Trudy Goodman. Um, he's been called a power player of the mindfulness movement by Wired Magazine. Um, and he currently lives in the Blue Ridge Mountains outside of Asheville, North Carolina with his partner, Emily, and their son, Xander. Um, so one thing that I love about Vince is he's a, <clears throat> he's a neighbor of mine where we live about 30 minutes from each other, sort of neighbor, neighbor over the mountains. And um, yeah, he's someone I really enjoyed get, getting to know. Um, and social meditation is a, is a practice that I've personally uh, really, really enjoyed practicing myself, um, sometimes facilitating and taking a few events to trainings. So um, yeah, with that, I'll let you add any other, any personal details you want to spin in yourself, Vince, but uh, thanks so much for, for joining. We're really grateful and I'll, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, B.I. Thank you, Aaron, for inviting me. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's delightful to be with you on this Saturday afternoon, at least where I am. Uh, in terms of backstory, uh, I did want to share a few, I guess, anecdotes about my story as it relates to the theme of building a beautiful life and uh, in particular to the process of figuring out how to make a livelihood while doing that. Um, a little bit more about my personal background. I feel like this is important to share. Uh, I grew up in the, in the southeastern United States in a small rural county called Madison County. Uh, I grew up in, an, uh, in a family that had migrated here from the north. So we're northerners living in the south. And I grew up in a, in a multi-ethnic family. My mom was born in Kuwait. Uh, her father, my grandfather was Palestinian. And my grandmother on that side of the family, this is the family I grew up with, uh, was Scotch-Irish and her ancestors came here from Scotland and Ireland. So I grew up in a, in a, in a kind of confusing spot in between a lot of different worlds, the North and the South, uh, sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, especially Southern Baptist culture and uh, Palestinian immigrant Arab culture. And so um, for me, it wasn't a huge leap to get interested in Buddhism, to like get interested in yet another thing that's not conventional. And I'd say looking back uh, at my journey so far, I turned 40 last week. Uh, and so I describe myself sometimes jokingly as a geriatric millennial. Um, but uh, I'm at the tail, you know, the beginning of this sort of millennial generation of those of us who grew up on the internet. And when I look back, I think that how I got to where I am now was by very regularly making a move of letting go of the conventional path, often with a whole lot of fear involved and some reticence uh, in doing that, but ultimately letting go of some kind of idea, conventional idea of what I should be doing and going into the, into the mystery. And then finding that some years later, a lot of other people got interested in that area that I'd followed. And so then I could sort of find a way to make a successful livelihood there, even though it, it was not obvious at all or apparent that that would be possible while I was following my own interests. 
And I guess that's kind of what I want to say up front. It's just like the, the way to live a beautiful life is seemingly from my point of view to, to trust in one's intuition and follow it. Uh, even if it's not apparent that you're going to be able to make a livelihood. <laughs> um, I know that sounds like weird, maybe weird advice, but that's what's worked for me. Um, the first time I did this was in college. I was a computer engineering student at a, a, uh, like a, a North Carolina university. And uh, I was good at, with computers and tech. So, and, I, and they told me I was going to make a lot of money you know, doing this. And I liked it. So I thought, great, great career path. And then I had an existential and spiritual kind of meltdown in my freshman year of college started asking some questions like probably you all are and have been about who am I and what's true and what's important. And uh, as a result of that, I dropped out of the computer engineering program and I shifted over to philosophy, Western philosophy in particular, thinking I could still get a degree and study something interesting to me. But philosophy with some exceptions was not that interesting and it wasn't really getting at what I was looking for. So uh, I, I, during the same time, I was getting deeper into meditation and in particular Buddhist meditation. Uh, and so I decided actually just to drop out of school completely and to dedicate my time to uh, retreat practice and to um, meditating. And at this, at this time, this was in the 2002, um, the landscape was, was dominated by the boomers, the Buddhist <laughs> boomers. <laughs> Um, uh, there were some Gen Xers, but not many, uh, they mostly seemed to avoid the Dharma scene. Uh, and so, uh, it was, it was a sort of an odd move from a certain point of view to drop out of a, of a, a, success, a potentially successful career as a computer engineer and to, uh, go hang out with a bunch of boomer Buddhists. Um, but that's where I needed to be. And this was around the time that mindfulness was starting to take off, but it was not at all the case that it wasn't clear that that was going to happen. So that was the first time that I, I sort of said goodbye to the conventional path. And it was gradual. Like I had to shift into philosophy first and realize, no, no, that's not, it's not a big enough letting go. I've got to actually like stop going to school altogether <laughs> and, and make my own, make my own way. Um, fortunately, my partner and now wife, Emily, at the time, she's very smart. She brought a, a magazine to me and she said, Hey, look at the back of this magazine, this ad. And she said, uh, and it was an advertisement for Naropa university, a Buddhist school in Colorado. She said, look, you could go meditate and get your degree. You know, I said, Oh, okay. And I, I, I fell for the trap, you know? Uh, and I, uh, actually it was good. I, 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 I transferred to Naropa. Uh, and while I was there, this, the sort of, this was the next, uh, I guess, example of letting go of the conventional. I, I became immersed in the Buddhist world, uh, going on retreats, being at Naropa. Uh, and one of our friends and I, we sort of, at a certain point, we were lamenting, you know, kind of complaining, really, about uh, how, the, how the, our teachers, who we loved, uh, and their colleagues, all of whom were boomers, again, um, how they really didn't seem to even get that there could be something positive about technology. At the time, the narrative was very negative in the Buddhist world. There was, uh, it was more or less like poo-pooing on all technology. Uh, now we're in a very different place culturally now where we really have questioned how good technology is. And I think that's, that's a good thing. But at the time it was just assumed there could be nothing positive. Uh, and I was still into tech and still into you know, the internet culture. So I was like, this is ridiculous. No one, no one is talking about these things, about how technology could become part of the path. So we started a, a podcast called Buddhist Geeks. Um, and we were really trying to explore that um, from a kind of elder millennial perspective. You know, what, what, how is the internet transforming Buddhist practice? How is Buddhist practice a theory affecting the development of culture um, and technology? And we, we were asking those questions, which again, at the time didn't, was not obvious at all. Uh, if you just looked around the Dharma scene, that that would be a good thing to do. Uh, and fortunately, there were, there were a lot of people interested in that conversation. So Buddhist geeks became a, a thing. And that's in large part how I was able to um, start working for myself in 2010 was by working on that project.
and by starting to teach meditation. Uh, and at that time, uh, as a new meditation teacher, I was looking for any kind of edge I could get. Um, because, you know, when you first start something, you feel completely incompetent in some ways, that's true. And so um, I, I had a, a close teacher and a friend of mine named Kenneth Folk who called me up one day and he said, Vince, I've discovered an incredible way to teach this meditation technique that you and I are both familiar with, which is called mental noting. Uh, and in a new way, that's like way more effective. And so he began to tell me how in the traditional method, of course, of this technique, you're, you're just using words or labels to describe to yourself internally what you're experiencing moment to moment. Has anyone done this practice before the mental noting technique? Yeah, some of you are familiar with it. Um, so I'd done this practice a lot, uh, gone on retreats and done it for even months at a time. I was very familiar with it and I thought it was an awesome technique. Um, but here was my teacher saying, there's a way to share this with other people that's literally 10 times more effective. Uh, and I said, okay, tell me more, you know, I want to figure out how to do this. And he said, well, basically all I, all I, what I realized is uh, if I meditate, if I do this technique out loud with other people, uh, it's way easier to teach it because in the old way of teaching, you know, as a teacher, you give the instructions, the person goes, they hear the instructions, they interpret them. And then they go off, they do them, hopefully. And then they hopefully come back at some point and share how it went. Uh, and then the teacher has to listen to their story and sort of listen for the salient points. Uh, and because of course, there's some amount of interpretive nonsense that we all add on top of what's salient, our own story. And then give people feedback and say, okay, given what I just heard, here's some feedback on how to improve your technique, how to do this better. And what Kenneth realized is you could do that instantly in the moment with out loud noting, what he ended up calling social noting. And not only could he hear how other people were practicing and give them feedback right there, he could also model how to practice. And that's very valuable um, if you've been doing something for tens of thousands of hours to be able to actually demonstrate or show people how you do it. Because there's a lot we learn that's not just conceptual, right? We learn through osmosis, through taking in each other's all kinds of things. So I was excited. I was like, yes, there is a way that I could be a better teacher. <laughs> it was really mostly about that at the time. Um, but what I didn't realize, and I don't think what Kenneth realized either quite yet was, was the profundity of, of turning these practices, which were typically done silently by oneself um, in an introspective way, making them a more ex extroverted activity a more relational process. And he wasn't the only person doing this at the time. There were others, some others, who, many of whom I talked to on Buddhist Geeks, like Gregory Kramer's Insight Dialogue or Diane Musha Hamilton and her big mind process that she was teaching. Uh, and I've been exposed to those and I thought they were very cool, but this was much more close to home. It was like, this is a technique that I know really well. Uh, and it was profound, it was so profound one, because Kenneth was right, it was a lot more effective to teach. So it helped me as a teacher uh, and it helped the people I was working with most importantly. Uh, and then also uh, what was so profound to me, having done at this point, several months of silent retreat practice and many, many hours um, you know, out, outside of retreat uh, was just how much I needed this practice to help me bridge the deep introspective insights and awarenesses that develop on retreat or in deep daily life practice with other people um, who weren't also hardcore meditators. Uh, and this practice just gave me a way to externalize and relationalize uh, these techniques that I, that I learned. And, and the, the major thing that opened up for me was a, capa a newfound capacity to be aware not only of my own experience, which I was quite good at at that point, but also to include other people's experience at the same time, to be aware of both myself and others, and to hold both in awareness without collapsing so easily onto one side or the other, you know, to collapsing into myself, to becoming self-absorbed, uh, which is my tendency, or to collapse into others, to lose myself in others, which is some other, you know, other people have that tendency. 
And for me, social meditation was a way of holding the non-duality. You know, we use that term in in the Buddhist world, of course, it's confusing too, but the non-duality of self and other. Um, And that wasn't something that I had really realized through retreat practice and through this sort of individualistic focus, um, which again, I think was part of the boomer Buddhist culture, cultural matrix that I'd studied in. And so once again, I found myself breaking with convention, um, you know, finding this new way to practice that really not a whole lot of people seem to get. And even now, it, although the uptake is, it, it's people, more people are getting it. And I think younger people get it quicker and get it easier um, in part because we all did come up uh, on the internet. And so for us, the primary metaphor is not the self, the individual, but it's really the network. You know, we came up in a networked society and we understand ourselves as networked, you know, who we are and our identity shifts and morphs as the networks we engage in shift and change. So I think it's a little easier for us, uh, say us, (laughs) you all, us, those of us who are digital natives to intuitively understand the importance of making meditation relational, of, of it being an actual interactive and engaged relational practice. So this is a little about my backstory and kind of uh, also a way of introducing social meditation, which I'd like to, to do a couple rounds of practice with you all or invite you to do it. Yeah. Um, I did also want to do just a quick check-in um, before we get into that. I'd love to hear, uh, hear y'all's voices um, and to introduce a very, very, very simple social meditation exercise in doing so. Uh, So if you're up for it, I'd like to invite you to uh, one at a time, as you feel moved, come off of mute and share your name, uh, where you're based geographically or where you're currently at location wise in the world. And then the third thing is to invite you to say there is, and then a word or two that describes your overall state right now, like where where you are, your state of mind. And that's the basic social meditation instruction. There is, and then a word or two to describe however you're doing right now, like a state check-in. So I'll demonstrate this first. Uh, Again, my name is Vince. I'm based outside of Asheville, North Carolina. And there is energy and excitement. Again, feel free to come off mute and check in as you feel moved. Um, My name is Sarah. I'm based in Tampa, Florida. There is connection. Welcome. I'm Sophie, um, currently residing in Northern California. There is lots of energy in my gut and my chest and excitement. There is excitement. Welcome, Sophie. My name is Aaron. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. I feel happy. Oh, there is happy and bubbly kind of. (laughs) Welcome. Uh, My name is Amy. I'm in Boston. There is anticipation and openness. Welcome, Amy. My name is Sydney, um, and I'm in the car right now. I think, I think in Rhode Island, near Rhode Island. Um, oh, I'm in Connecticut, and 
there is some sleepiness and some excitement. Welcome, wherever you are. My name is Kaya. I am calling from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And for me, there is peace and there is drive. Thank you, Kaya. Um, my name is Izzy. I'm currently in Madrid, Spain. There is exhaustion and gratitude. Welcome, Izzy. I'm Haley. I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, and there is connection and interest. Welcome, Haley. I'm Josie. I'm in Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And there is curiosity and some nervousness. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. Right now, there is a lot of energy, I'd say. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ava. I'm in Italy right now, and there's also a lot of energy and a lot of distraction. And also, I didn't anticipate this, but my phone might die, but I don't mean to leave if that happens. Welcome, Ava. My name is Kendra. I'm in Atlanta. And right now there is uh, buzzing and tension. Welcome. I'm Rachel. I'm in Boston. And there is anticipation and calmness. Welcome. My name is Kavya. I'm in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, there is contentment and confidence. Welcome, Kavya. Okay, would anyone else like to check in? I'm PI, calling from North Carolina. There is warmth and there is anticipation. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for checking in. Good to hear your voices. And there you go. You just did your first social meditation exercise. We do this all the time, um, you know, checking in in a group. But, um, and you probably had an experience, right, of checking in about how you're feeling at the beginning of a group. Um, we just used a simple social meditation frame for that, which is there is. This was something that uh, Kenneth Folk, who I mentioned earlier, he developed as a, as a teaching tool uh, to help people get a sense for how to frame the language they're using in this practice. By putting there is in front of it, it tends to put the language uh, that we use after that when we say whatever there is into the what's called the gerund form. Um, you don't have to get nerdy about this. Uh, I, to be honest, still don't fully understand the linguistics of it. But in the gerund form, which usually often ends with ing, um, there's a sense in which a noun becomes like a verb or a process. We start to see a thing as a process. And this is really helpful for mindfulness or Vipassana style practice, right? To see things as process. So the words, there is, there is what? What is there? When you, you well, first you have to look and see. You have to look and see what's in your experience. There's what? There's looking. There's 
nervousness. There's breathing. There's releasing. When I started sharing these practices, I, I quickly realized that all the teachers were doing in the front of the Dharma hall room when they guided meditations was doing social meditation out loud with no one else interacting with them. They were in real time sharing their experience, guiding people using their own sense of things and in a very much in a broadcast style way, right? In the way that we broadcast television or radio, there's a single source that's transmitting the signal. And then there's a bunch of receivers. This is a 20th century model. Social meditation is a 21st century model. It's, it's patterned after the type of peer to peer network, uh, peer to peer networks that we see today, which are, are significantly more popular, uh, with respect to media in that everyone is participating and there isn't per se a privileged position, although you could say the facilitator is a sort of privileged peer. Um, but in these practices, the way that I teach them and, and share them, um, any of you are welcome to share whatever we do here with other people. Um, it's open source. You're welcome to share these techniques. We just ask that you share, you know, mention where they came from. Um, and they're peer to peer. So if you share instructions with someone and say, Hey, we're going to do, there is noting, we're going to take turns saying there is, and then a word or two to describe whatever it is that we notice. Um, then you would just participate as one of the people doing the practice. And so that's, that's, that to me is part of the profundity of these social style practices or what I would call multiplayer meditation is that they can be done in a way that um, is more native to the internet logic, you know, to the logic of the network. And I think this has a lot of benefits um, when we align our practice with how our lives actually are because then the practice becomes more useful. We don't have to sort of fight to integrate something uh, with the rest of our life because it's already designed with that in mind. So um, that's my, my <laughs> sales pitch, I guess, for social meditation. Um, and then, you know, I hope that the practice will, will speak for itself uh, as we do it. To, to explore the question of livelihood, I thought we could use social meditation uh, to sort of check in to see what is ours to do. This is a, a basic inquiry question. You could frame it, uh, if you're saying it to yourself, what is mine to do? What is mine to do? It's, it's actually amazing how much meditative methods can be used to help gain relative insights. We usually talk about them in terms of gaining like absolute insight. You know, you want to gain insight into the true nature of experience, but you can use these methods to also gain insight into all kinds of other things. They're just techniques of using consciousness or using the mind as a tool for understanding something. Um, and so we can also use these techniques like inquiry meditation or social inquiry as we're gonna to do to explore what is our purpose? Uh, what, which, what is mine to do as a way of exploring that? What, why are we here? What are we doing? Open question, okay? Um, and in, in the first practice I'd like to offer or uh, suggest we do here together, um, it's just called, what is mine to do? It's a social inquiry practice. And the basic instructions are, we're gonna go into small groups of like three or four people each for like several minutes, maybe say seven minutes. And we'll just take turns one at a time. When it's your turn, you can say either, what is mine to do? Or you can say, pass, some variation of that. Like you can say, don't know, pass. Um, both of those are options. And all we're going to do in this practice is just to deepen into this question. We're not going to try to answer it yet. Uh, although answers may come in doing the practice, 
um, we're, we're actually just going to keep coming back or returning to the question. Has anyone worked with an inquiry question before or a question as your practice? I was curious. Yeah, BI has, Sophie. Yeah. Okay. So for some of you, this may be new. Okay, good. Great. This is a great practice. It's actually inquiry meditation is like, uh, it, it, it's the most disliked form of meditation in my experience but it can be the most uh, insightful also. Um, why is it disliked? I don't know. I have a theory about it, which is that I think it's difficult to sit in, question, in, in open questions without having answers. I think that's, my, that's the basic, my basic theory. Um, and because it's really difficult and uncomfortable, we don't wanna do it. Um, but it can be very powerful to do that because oftentimes we settle uh, we settle for an answer which is not deep enough to actually um, be fulfilling to live in, if that makes sense. Um, like for me, it was good enough that I could do something that I'd enjoy in school and have the promise of making money at the end, right? That was good enough until I started asking the quest some questions. Like what is truth? Well, I don't think com the computer engineering discipline <laughs> was not going to give me that answer. <laughs> you know? um, at least I don't think so. Um, and like, what does it matter if I have enough money, if I'm fundamentally unhappy uh, and don't know who I am and why I'm alive? You know, it's like, great, I've got money. Okay, now what? You know, um, and, and of course, these are very good problems to have, right? These are problems that we have when we have enough. Um, and yet they are still problems. And so if you feel these problems as I do, then it's good to get into the question, to deepen into the question so that maybe we can gain some clarity on the matter. And we gain the clarity not by trying to figure out the answer, but by deepening into the questions themselves. Um, as uh, Rainer Maria, Maria Rilke, the German poet said, we, we live into the questions, actually. So this is a question I just want to invite us to live into together a bit. What is mine to do? What is mine to do? And you might notice as you, if you ask that question to yourself right now, what is mine to do? That the question itself becomes the meditation object. We're actually trying to be with the question. My teacher, uh, one of my teachers, Trudy Goodman Cornfield, uh, who was a Zen teacher before she started teaching insight meditation. And they'd done a lot of koan work, you know, work with a lot of questions and inquiries. Um, she, she said it this way to me. She said, you know, with the inquiry practice, you ask this question and then it's like if you lose your keys or your phone and you're trying to find it, you're going through the house, you know, looking for your keys, looking for your phone. When you do that, you don't just keep repeating to yourself, keys, keys, keys. Oh, you might do that some, right? In case you lose track of what you're doing. But for the most part, you're just with the looking. You're just looking, you're just going and looking. And it's the same with these practices. When we ask the question, what is mine to do? And that's like the keys or the phone, we're looking. It's like, we don't know where it is. We're gonna keep looking for it. And we just stay with the looking. And the cool thing about the social part of this is that every time someone else asks the question, that can help us remember to look. So we can kind of draft off of each other's inquiry as well here, get the benefit of each other's a mutual, it's a mutual inquiry in what is ours to do. Okay, let me stop here and see, are there any questions so far? about the instructions that I've shared. We'll go several minutes just taking turns. When it's your turn, you can say aloud, what is mine to do? Or you can pass, you can just say pass. Uh, I wanna add a third option here, which is you can also stay on mute or, or mute yourself, at which point we'll know that you're a silent observer or a witness to the practice. Perhaps it's loud where you are, your internet connection is poor, or you're just actually feeling like you want to go inward and just, you know, ask the question to yourself while listening to others. Any, it doesn't really matter the reason. At any point, you can mute yourself and be a silent observer or witness in this practice. And if you come off of mute, 
and you can just, you know, um, reinsert yourself into the, into the flow, you know, uh, and, and trust that, you know, we can, we can, we can figure out whose turn it is well enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, any questions so far about any of that instructions? So from, it seems like we're, we're um, like repeating the question and if there are answers, we can share them, but not necessarily. Yeah, so for the, for, for the instructions of this round, uh, I'd invite you to um, keep the answers to yourself. But in the, in a, if we have time, I, I, I do wanna do another round in which there is a bit of a call and response question and answer. So there will be, we're, we're gonna build up to that, but I'm thinking in this round, if we, if we don't do that, then that'll make the climax of doing the answers even more you know, uh, interesting. So yeah, answers will come and we just, we won't verbalize them in this, in this practice, or at least that's not what the instructions are. Yeah. Any other questions about the instructions, how to do this? Okay. When we get back after the several minutes uh, being in small groups of three to four, um, We'll do a quick reflection round where I'll invite you to share a word or two on how it went. It'll be pretty quick, but uh, just to just to let you know that'll happen after. Anything anyone else needs before we begin? Would you just repeat the question one more time? Yeah, and actually I'll put it in the chat as well. Thanks, Kendra. Um, the question is, what is mine to do? What is mine to do? Okay, so BI will, um, unless there are any question, other questions, BI will put us into breakout rooms. BI, please be sure to put me in one as well. Yeah. And yourself, if you feel comfortable doing that. Okay, great. great. All right, enjoy. Hey, welcome back. Thank you. We'll uh, wrap up this practice with just a quick reflection round. Similar to what we did in the check-in, I'll invite you just here to come off of mute as you feel moved and share a couple words on how the practice was for you, if you were to just summarize it in, a, in a one or two words even. How was that? If you like, you could say there was instead of there is before it, you don't have to, just some people find that helpful. There was joy. There was some silliness. <laughs> there was so much more quiet in my mind. There was acceptance. There was a paradox of grasping and spaciousness. There was compassion and comedy. <laughs> there was reflection and quiet. There was curiosity and desire to connect. There was discomfort and opening. There was kind of a feeling of calm and a feeling of being connected. There was fogginess. <laughs> there was presencing and grief.
there was inquiry and settling in. Anyone else care to share what there was for you? If there's nothing else, we'll move on. There was continual making of narratives and grasping. Okay, anything else? All right, well done, good job. You did it. You're social meditators now, if you weren't already. Um, so, so this is just a taste, right, of, um, of the style of practice where we're verbalizing something out loud with other people that's meditative. There's lots of different ways we could do this. Um, we could note what we're experiencing, like Kenneth Folk, you know, social noting technique. We could do social inquiry where we're asking questions. We could be doing social meta or loving kindness practice where we're sharing our well wishes out loud. I highly recommend that one. Um, I think meta practice is enhanced a lot by making it social because it's already such a pro-social practice. But if you think about it, it's kind of taught in an antisocial way where you're sort of wishing well to others in your own mind. <laughs> um, so doing it out loud, I think really helps generate lots more uh, feeling of boundless love and care. So um, you could do social samadhi practice where you know samadhi is like bringing attention to a single point. Just recently, I did a practice where we all were saying as we felt moved one, we are all focused on the number, actually one, or you could say the concept of oneness. That was very powerful and it worked for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, inquiry is one way. And I hope that you sort of could get a sense both for the unique effects of the inquiry practice itself, and then the way that doing it out loud with other people changed things. And you could sort of hear that in the reflections too. Uh, like, for instance, the comedy, humor, laugh it, laughter, that's unique to social meditation. I mean, you say it can happen in a silent meditation group, like where someone starts to laugh and then it, you know, it can happen. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it happens a lot more reliably with other people. Uh, and it kind of yeah, has throwback. It's like a throwback to, to me of like remembering what it was like in like grade school, you know, to just be like cutting up and being silly in a way that felt, um, yeah, like breaking the conventions again. Uh, like, oh, this isn't what, you shouldn't be laughing in meditation. Why? <laughs> it's like, why? Why shouldn't you be laughing during meditation or talking for that matter? Um, I don't know. I used to think that was important. And now I realize it was, it was just an idea that a lot of people believe for a long time. Most of monks <laughs> make sense uh, that they would think that. But for us, we don't have to do it that way. We can practice some other way. And then what is yours to do? Yeah, what is yours to do? I want to take this inquiry deeper uh, in the next round of practice. Um, in, in the Zen tradition, which, which I practiced in a little bit, and I, as I said, I've had teachers who, who had backgrounds there, so I picked stuff up from them. And uh, in, in the, what's called the koan tradition where you're actually working through a series of stories or koans, or sometimes they're called riddles, but, um, you know, oftentimes they're actual inquiry questions. Like what is the sound of one hand or who am I? Um, in, in, in this way of practicing, if any of you've done this, you'll know that, um, there is actually a right answer to the koan, uh, or at least there's an answer that will pat you'll get, you'll, you'll pass. And so in the koan practice, what happens is you go sit with the Zen teacher. Uh, they kind of ask you the question, the koan, they, they, they bring it up to you. Like one, one I remember working on was count all the stars in the sky. That was the koan. 
or walk straight on a curvy path was another one. Um, and then the idea is you actually respond to the teacher. You, sh you, you demonstrate the answer to them. Um, I want to invite a kind of practice in which that is the kind of dynamic in which it's both calling out the inquiry and responding. Uh, we won't, there won't be a passing <laughs> answer here. So there isn't like a, in, in this case, there isn't a right or wrong answer. Uh, in Zen, there is actually, um, there, at least there are wrong answers. Um, but here, the, the question is simple. What is yours to do? So if I'm asking you, what is yours to do? Then you could respond, right? And, and here, the response is meditative as well. Uh, there's some parameters around the response I want to share with you. One is you have one breath to, in this practice to respond. So this is going to limit what you can say, but it's not going to limit it too, too much. You could come up with something, right? Um, so what is yours to do? And then you could respond. I don't know what mine is to do. <laughs> that's, a, that's a legitimate response. You could say that. Or so you could say, you know, what is yours to do? Social meditation, that's mine to do. Okay, cool. You've got one breath. You can respond to whatever we want. It can change as we go. Um, we're going to work in this practice in groups of three, three people each. And uh, we're going to do like a few rounds, five minutes each round, pretty much back to back to back. Um, and what's going to happen is in the first round, someone will be the, the prompter, the inquirer, someone will be the responder, and, and the other person will be a witness, will be silently observing the back and forth. So for five minutes, you'll have someone saying, what is yours to do? And then you'll have someone responding to that question with one breath. After they've responded, the, the prompter, the inquirer, the instructions for you are to say, thank you. That's it. Thank you. And then again, what is yours to do? BI, do you think we could demonstrate this real quick? Would you be up for me prompting you? Sure. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Okay. So we'll just do a few rounds here and uh, uh, just so you can get a sense for what this could look like. What's yours to do? You look at the Zoom screen. Thank you. What is yours to do? To be with my confusion. Thank you. What is yours to do? To laugh and to dance and to sing. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thank you, BI. Well done. So this is an example of what it could look like. Um, let me see if there are any questions so far about the instructions or just kind of how we're gonna do this. Let me also ask maybe in the chat, is there anyone who can't be on the mic microphone right now? If you could chat me or let me know, uh, let us know so that we can make sure we uh, take that into consideration. There might be a group that has two witnesses, for instance, um, or one person who's just witnessing during the whole thing because they need to. So feel free to let us know if you need, if you need to be a witness throughout. You could either chat, chat us or uh, raise your hand here and let us know. Okay. Yep. Okay. Christopher, you need to witness. Great, so we'll make sure we put Christopher in a group with three other people and you'll just know Christopher's witness today. And then we won't rotate you, Christopher. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be the, uh, the eye in the sky the entire time. You'll be holding down the witness position for us. Okay, any other questions? Aaron, MBI, does this make sense in terms of the breakout rooms? I think we're going to kind of come back after five minutes and then, uh, and I'll just say a little like, okay, now rotate time to rotate. And then we'll go back and for another five minutes and then we'll do that three times. If that makes sense. Oh, and if you could put the, the timer countdown on the breakouts, that would be helpful. 
so we can see how many minutes are left if you know how you to do that three different rounds of breakouts or one breakout that we rotate three times so uh three rounds but we'll be in the same group each time and uh we're only going to break just so that i can um tell people to shift roles basically yeah yeah should be possible <laughs> okay if we'll figure it out <laughs> it's a little complicated but any other questions before we begin about how to do the practice what we're doing this is a social inquiry practice i may have missed some of the instruction it's so one person is asking and the other one is answering the whole way through or both people are answering yeah, so during the first five minutes, uh, one person will be the prompter, where you'll just be saying over and over again, what is yours to do, asking that question, and then when they respond, saying thank you. Uh, the other person will be the responder, you've got one breath to respond, and you can respond however you like, including don't know. And then the third person will be a silent observer or witness to the practice. And with each round, we'll rotate so that you, like, you'll change roles and you'll get a chance to be in all three roles, except for Christopher, who will be omni-witnessing. And how will we know which role to choose? That's a great question. Um, I guess I would suggest that when you go into the room the first time, someone asks the question, what is yours to do? That will identify you as the prompter for that round. And then someone respond. And then you've got the responder. And then the person who didn't ask or respond is the witness. Um, and then uh, and then we'll rotate in a way that'll be a lot. I'll, I'll actually tell you how to rotate in the next round so that you'll know which role to be in in the next round. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. OK. I know it's a lot of moving pieces here, but uh, it should be doable. <laughs> including VI. Um, so here we just have a couple minutes. Um, so I want to invite you just in the chat uh, so we can all see each other's responses, kind of just to share a few words on how that practice was for you. Um, and we'll just take a minute to share and then to take, in, take in each other's reflections. And then we'll wrap up. And there was beauty. I'll share some of these out loud as see them. <laughs> Truth serum. Ah, cool. Surprising insight. Nice. Noticing the intimacy between the inquirer and the responder. Self-awareness. Yeah. Nice, there was connectedness. Nice gratitude in response to the thank you. More powerful than you expected, hey. Nice. Hey. Great. So going through the process, starting one place, ending in another one with more compassion and gratitude. Lovely, calm, appreciation, connection. Yeah. Not immediately obvious how asking a question and responding could lead to that, <laughs> but it does. It can. Yeah. Good job. All right. I just want to honor the time that we have here together and the commitment we made. Um, so feel free to continue sharing as you like and taking it in, but also want to um, close here and just thank you for your time and attention today. I hope this was useful. As I said, if you find any of this practical or helpful, feel free to share it. You can just mention where you learned it from and that'll be sufficient for me. Um, again, thank you. Vince, I want to say thank you again for uh, for joining. And also, if there's anything that you're doing that you want to plug or ways that people can learn more about you and social meditation and this whole kind of world of practice that you're you're pulling on, I think I think some folks might want to know a little more. OK, cool. Well, um, the one thing I would share here is if if you if you get a chance and you are willing to try this out, 
I recently, uh, with a friend created <laughs> this meditation app. It's a multiplayer meditation app called meditate with AI. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you, if you get a chance to try it, it's, uh, the out loud noting practice, but with an, with an humanized AI system. So we're trying to figure out how to share these practices more broadly. And we figured maybe that could be a good starting point. Um, so I would be curious to hear if you have any thoughts on that. If you ever want to come practice with humans, uh, we will have the human part of that app at some point, but uh, you could also check out the Buddhist Geeks Network. We're, we're there. It's a free community. And uh, we do a lot of social meditation stuff there, as BI can attest to. So feel free to check out either of those if they're of interest to you. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. It's a lot of, a lot of fun. Thank, thank you, you all. Thanks for hosting hosting me. Appreciate Thank you, Vince. It. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye, Kavya.